When Rufus Norris recently announced he would be stepping down from his role as director of the National Theatre, some commentators struggled to summarise his legacy. Initiatives on uh, diversity, improving accessibility of the theatre and broadening its appeal to a wider modern audience have been administrative or, or happened under the radar. All the average punter can judge on is the programming which has been at times, well, curious. For every Hades town there's been a hex. For every small island there's been a Salome. Norris's own Macbeth was rather mundane. And then there's Manor, the only play at the National to ever receive zero stars. A play that Norris isn't alone in wishing he could forget. Reviving Lucy Preble's The Effect is perhaps a last ditch attempt at showing the National Theatre in modern dress. Now, you may think that's counterintuitive, given that I've just said this is a revival. But this particular production, playing in an almost unrecognisable Littleton, feels fresh, exciting and achingly now. If you thought this South Bank venue was just for stuffy old classicists, seeing the effect may make you think again. First performed in 2012 at the National Smaller Cottesloe Space, now the Dorfman, play questions whether the effect of the antidepressant era has been as positive as we may have imagined. It's set during the clinical trial of some Prozac 2.0 drug, led by psychiatrist Dr James, Michelle Austin, and her boss and ex-lover, Dr Seeley, Cobner Holbrook-Smith. The former is at first efficient and controlled, only later slowly revealing the cracks underneath, while the latter is there to offer support, like a criminal comforts their victim. Holbrook Smith has a, a voice like velvet, we're never sure if that velvet will soothe or smother. If they are the masters, then the puppets they control are the, the patients, the volunteers. Psychology student Connie, Taylor Russell, and your boy from Hackney before it fell, Tristan, Papa Essidu, couldn't be more different. She is an anxious, softly spoken American, confident in her cynicism but also frightened by it. He carries himself with the, the smarts and the, the swagger of the streetwise, oozing with the self-assuredness of someone for whom this is definitely not his first rodeo. All four are strong but Essie Do is in a, a league all of his own. He embodies this character as though he may have just been picked up from Hackney Central Station. Loose and laid back, he glides across the stage like someone who's used to making, wherever he is, his manner. It's a performance rich with naturalistic nuances. Is it? For reals? And this throaty giggle he gives here. Uh, uh, feel like they're ad libs falling out of his mouth rather than lines given to him. He's a wonder to watch, and watching him here makes it very difficult to imagine his Hamlet or his, his Romeo, and I mean that as a complete compliment. Early on, the patients discover they share a birthday. It's the only thing these two complete strangers have in common, and it's given a heightened intimacy that draws them together. The trial progresses and this relationship is observed. As the doses increase, so do the side effects. Changes to appetite, excretion, sleep patterns, and even hearing are physical and all ascribed to the medication. Changes to their emotional states and behavior just raise the questions. The initial mutual attraction leads to a, a gentle flirtation. That in turn builds to a, a lustful desire. Eventually that sees them declare 
their undying love for each other, a love that is first freeing, but then soon becomes suffocating. This may be just the rom-com trope of opposites attracting, but we know it's not. Is it some kind of drug-induced emotional hallucination? But then we're asked, does it even matter? Isn't love, the place suggests, it's some, just some psychological construct we build in order to avoid being lonely in later life? And if that's the case, how are the drug's objectives any different when their intention is to make us happy? The effect doesn't have any answers to give, but that's because there aren't any. Director Jamie Lloyd is at the helm, here for only his second time at the National Theatre, and you can sense his influence from the beginning. If you don't know his name, you may well have seen one of the 50 or so productions he's directed since 2010. He's one of the most hard-working directors around. Recently, he did an open-air, in-your-face Afita. And before that, there was the, the rapping, bullhorn carrying Serrano de Bergerac. Currently, his version of A Doll's House is making Broadway audiences actually choose to see Ibsen. Lloyd is known as a sort of rebel, but unlike directors whose avant-garde approaches are only ever seen by a small minority of similar-minded thinkers, Lloyd subverts our expectations using very quiet precision. His work is always striking but never showy, exciting but never extravagant. If he's a rebel, he is a covert rebel. That said, his impact here with designer Sutra Gilmore is pretty clear. For a start, when you walk into the Littleton, you'll notice the stage is missing. A narrow platform sits in the centre with, in traverse style with, with the seating on either side. There is no set other than a bucket with a brain in it. A plastic chair on each side, like, like the type you used to get at school. On, on each sits one of the medical staff controlling or just left helplessly watching the trial as it continues. The patient's areas are set in between these chairs and are lit with clinically white LED lighting. Lighting designer John Clark separates the two volunteers by creating very sharp clear geometric shapes which over time blend to become one space that they both inhabit. Bursts of music rap dance, punctuate the scenes, underscoring emotion and swelling with dramatic clashes. The whole piece feels sublimely cinematic, like, like watching a film being played live in front of you. So if we're looking to, to make the theatre more accessible, more modern, Let's just pause a moment and look at the cool points here. <laughs> Director Jamie Lloyd, named the 20th most powerful person in theatre in 2014. Currently, he's the 10th. Oh, and did I mention he got the Littleton to be completely fucking refigured? <laughs> Actor Papa Essidou named one of Forbes 30 under 30 in 2018. Currently on the shortlist, potentially, to be the next James Bond. And then we have the writer, Lucy Preble. The effect was only Preble's third play. Her second was the smash hit Enron. Her bestie is the 
uber cool Billy Piper, who played the original Connie, who she went on to write the tragedy with laughs, I Hate Susie. In 2021, Preble was named one of six queens of theatre on International Women's Day. Most recently, she was exec producer and lead writer on the global smash hit Succession. Fundamentally, you warm to them and sympathise with them at the same time as sort of being repulsed. The president is going to need to offer an alternative face for this discussion. If I drop my pants, I can show you an alternative face. Anytime you're struggling to define genre, that means someone's written something really original. Watching the effect just makes pine and hope that she will return her talents to theatre someday soon. Now, if that triumvirate could cool, doesn't make you icy. That led no pleasing you, frankly. Cool. Though it pains me to say it, I do have one major qualm. It takes place in, in the dramatic peak during the what would be the middle act. A dosing incident has had a major impact on one of the patients. Meanwhile, the, the history and emotional state of the doctors leads to an explosion. These scenes happen concurrently, but the tension doesn't just mount or build. It is, it is heavily piled on like, like too much relish to ruin a burger. The small space that has been so effective till now suddenly seems too small, uh, so it's restricting the, the actors. As the scenes overlap, the actors start raising the volume of their voices, shouting to be heard by us, which means we just end up hearing nothing. The, the women in particular start at level screech and just go higher and higher. It sounds as painful to their vocal cords as it is to our ears. At the same time, they start doing that horribly stagey Thing of running round in circles as they argue, looking for somewhere to escape. The sort of thing that no one ever does in real life because we have things called doors. The whole thing is dramatic with a, a capital A for amateur. And it's odd because for this 10 minutes it feels like we're watching a play that's completely different, one that wasn't written by Preble, one that wasn't directed by Lloyd. The play returns to normal very quickly, thank God. Business as usual. But it's a very dis disturbing anomaly that doesn't fit. If it wasn't for this, I would have no hesitation in awarding five stars. There's no surprises that Norris wants to be remembered for the last period of his tenure. On the horizon, there's a new musical, but this time it has um, Roald Dahl's Witches as its source, so surely that's got to be a hit. If we look at the West End right now, the national production of The Crucible is currently playing its transfer, and in a couple of months' time it will be joined by the Voter in the Queue, Dear England, and the return of the ocean at the end of the lane. Fast forward another couple of months, and the musicals Hades Town and Standing at the Sky's Edge will also be in the West End. That's six transfers of National Theatre production under Rufus Norris's leadership that are playing the West End almost concurrently. You want proof of making theatre accessible to a wider audience? Take a look at these theatrical apples. I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm fairly definite, that the effect will end up being the seventh West End transfer to come from the National Theatre in this short period of time. Frankly, if such a, a, an exciting and dynamic show like this doesn't make a West End, I, I may well need to check my Prozac dosage.